بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراح الحمد لله بيف توفيق to continue our study of معارف القرآن by late آية الله مسبح رحمة الله عليه In the previous session we talked about different levels of Tawheed and then what is the bottom line of Tawheed? If someone only believes in one dimension of Tawheed or two, would it be enough or not? And we said no. We said that the bottom line is at Tawheed fil uluhiyya to believe that there is only one God that can be worshipped and should be worshipped. This requires at Tawheed fi wujub al wujud, at Tawheed fil khaliqiyya, at Tawheed fil rububiyya whether it be rububiyyat or takviniyya or tashri'iyya all of them must be there but unless reaches this point that there is only one true ma'bud it's not enough and this is why la ilaha illallah is a very important islamic motto it's very important uh, dhikr invocation because Elah, as we said before, means Ma'aluh, someone that is uh, suitable for Ibad. This is what we discussed in the last session. Now a question arises that when we say there is only one creator and one Lord or Rabb, does it mean that no one else can have any role in creation, in lordship, in the sense of running this world, or in legislation and being obeyed? Is it shirk? Is it a kind of polit polytheism to say that someone, for example, can have a role in risk for us or in death or life etc in knowledge some people in the muslim ummah who are not very deep and are not theologically and philosophically very well you know trained Unfortunately, they consider anything like saying that someone can have a role as shirk. Even if we say prophets and messengers may have some role in, ro in no management of this world, this is shirk. And therefore, the rest of Muslims, according to them, sometimes are introduced as mushrik but the quran tells us that this is not shirk unless someone believes that other than allah there is a person or there are people that can independently meaning independent from god do something in this world this is shirk of if we say even a prophet can do something independent from God, this is shirk. But depending on God, this is not shirk. And the Quran 
mentions examples. For example, Surah Ma'ida talks about some of the miracles of Isa ala nabiyyina wa alihi wa alayhi salam. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim wa idh takhluqu min al-teen ka hayat al-tayr bi-idhni fatanfuqu fiha fatakunu tayran bi-idhni wa tubruhu al-akmaha wa al-abrasa bi-idhni wa idh tukhruju al-mawta bi-idhni Allah mentions different miracles of Isa alayhi salam one is that he used to create from clay a statue of a bird and then blowing into it and become a living bird. He was able to cure those who had severe disease. For example, those who were not able to see maybe from birth, from childhood, those who had problem with their skin. Even Allah says, تُخْرِجُ الْمَوْتَى بِإِذْنِي You give life to the dead. He was able to revive the dead. So, is this shirk? Is na'uzu billah Quran teaching us a polytheistic idea? No. This is not shirk. This is obvious example of Tawheed. And it is very interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps repeating Bi'idhni with my permission, with my leave, with my blessing. Is takhluqu min at-teen kahayat at-teer Although it was possible to mention بإذني once, but in order to leave no chance for anyone to think that Isa السلام, was doing these things independently, Allah keeps repeating بإذني. No one should think that Isa alayhi salam, na'udhu billah, was a partner to God or was, you know, a person of, for example, uh, divinity and trinity. No, he's a servant of Allah, but very close to Allah, muqarrab, and has permission and authority by Allah to do such things. So, this is very much rooted in the Qur'an. We can bring lots of, uh, you know, ideas from philosophy to support this, about the hierarchical structure of agents. But the Qur'an is also very clearly s saying this. Ayatollah Misbah says, there have been some Muslims who were very much influenced by science and they try to have a scientific explanation of everything. In our discussions about uh, Quran, uh, we have mentioned that there are different attitudes towards tafsir. One was a tafsir al-ilmi, scientific interpretation of the Quran. Of course, to some extent it's very good. If you are equipped with science, you can understand things that other people cannot understand. But to force Qur'an to speak the language of science or to force Qur'an to be in compliance with science and then if something is above or beyond science reinterpreted by force to make it something which science can explain, this is a problem. So some Muslims try to 
interpret cases of mu'jiza or miracle in the Quran in the way that all are possible to be explained empirically, scientifically. When it, they come to Isa alayhi salam, for example, they say Isa was a great physician, a great medical doctor who was at the top of medicine and he was able to cure people who were very severely ill. But there is no mu'jizah as such. And when it comes to tukhrajul mawta, which means that you give life to the dead people, Ayatollah Mesbah says they are you know, forced to say some very funny things because they have no other choice. They have, you know, restricted themselves. So they say Isa alayhi salam used to bring the dead bodies out of the grave. Why? Why he should bring dead body out of the grave? Just to show their body, expose their body. Why? And what you do with another ayah? Okay, suppose here someone is saying, okay, we accept Tukhrajul Mawta, just means that he is bringing the bodies out of the grave. What do you do with this ayah that Isa alayhi salam himself talks and he says, Wa uhyil mawta bi I revive the dead bi Here, then you cannot, you know, say that. It's just a matter of bringing the bodies out of the graves. So why you need to explain everything with materialistic, empirical, scientific terms? Yes, science is very important. Science is very much uh, helping us to understand greatness of the creation. But science is one thing, one way of understanding is not the only thing for example can we say arts have to be scientifically explained no artists have different talents maybe scientists enjoy maybe they don't enjoy but even they if they enjoy as a science they cannot explain arts they cannot explain beauty there are two different things. Or, for example, tastes. Can science tell us, for example, about particular things that we taste? Particular attitudes that we have? Lots of things. So, the Quran is telling us that Isa, alayhi salam, as an example, and it's not only Isa, alayhi salam, Isa as an example was given permission by Allah and was empowered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do something which is related to, do, to creatorship, to managing and running and tadbir. Or for example, angels also. Quran says, فالمدبرات أمرا so angels are also involved in running of this world, but not independently. They are agents for Allah, instruments for Allah. This is Tawheed. Ayatollah Musbah Rahmatullah says, some people said, okay, the case that Quran mentions about Isa alayhi salam is fine. But we should not accept anything which is not mentioned in the Quran. It becomes shirk. He says, this is not acceptable. This, what type of argument is this? If this is shirk, whether it is mentioned in the Quran or not, it is shirk. If it is not shirk, then again, whether it's mentioned in the Quran or not, it's not shirk. 
it's not a matter of who had this power and who didn't have so that we say okay this is possible but we are not sure with respect to Isa we are sure because it's mentioned in the Quran others we are not sure for example if this was your point okay we say okay we have to bring reasons to prove that someone has this power but you must accept that this is possible If it was not possible, for Isa was also not possible, it was shirk. I remember many years ago in Birmingham, I had gone for tabligh. And then one Sunni brother who was influenced by these ideas of Wahhabis came to talk. And we had discussion about tabassul and about the ability of the Prophet to do something, etc. And he was saying that something similar. He was saying tabassul during the life of the Prophet is fine, but after death is shirk. If you go next to the grave of the Prophet, for example, and do tawassul, it's shirk. But when he was alive, he was able to do something. And I said exactly similar thing. I said, if asking someone other than Allah for help is shirk, it doesn't make difference whether that person is alive or not alive. If it is shirk, even if it is, he is alive, it's shirk. Forget shirk, say for example, I have doubt that whether Prophet even after his death can do something or not. Okay, then we can explain that death is for us, according to Islam, entering into greater life, not becoming nothing or having even reduced level of life. No, it's a greater life. We can talk about it, but why you say it's shirk? If it is shirk, people who ask him for help during the life of the Prophet also, they were mushrik, they suffered shirk. So, some people said that if we consider some role in Tadbir of alam for anyone other than Allah, this is shirk and actually the 95% of Muslims are mushrik according to them. If they be we believe in velayat takwini, generative guardianship, this is shirk for them. But it is rooted in the Quran. Then he says, similar thing can be said about legislative lordship. We said, it is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who can make the law. And he's the only one that can demand our obedience. We should obey him. But again, this is in the sense of independent Rububiya of Allah means that he doesn't need anyone he is our Lord but under him maybe other people have some role of obedience and law making so when we refer to the Quran we see for example Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Nisa verse 64 A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُطَاعَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ We have not sent any messenger except to be obeyed بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ again. Yes, they are مُطَاعَ but بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ So, because Allah wants us to obey them, we obey them. Not that we obey them independent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Or for example, Surah Ma'idah verse 92, وَأَتِيُ اللَّهَ وَأَتِيُ الرَّسُولُ Obey God and obey the Messenger. Or Surah Nisa 59, أَتِيُ اللَّهَ وَأَتِيُ الرَّسُولُ وَأُلِ الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ أَتِيُ اللَّهَ وَأَتِيُ الرَّسُولُ وَأُلِ الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ all al amr according to what we have received from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam are imams but this is in the first place because we follow imams according to the will of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the prophet of allah the messenger of allah conveyed the will of allah to us we obey imam but then because of imam we obey his deputies we obey those that have authority from imam fa'innahum hujjati alaykum wa ana hujjatullah those mujtahidin those jurists that have taqwa and reach the level of being a deputy of imam alayhi salam these people are obeyed but not independently because of imam and imam is obeyed because of the messenger and messenger is because of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so it's the authority that allah has granted to the messenger that is granted to the imam and is then granted to their deputies these have nothing to do with shirk this is not shirk. This is the hierarchical structure. Similar to this issue also can be seen in the controversy or discussions about Shafa. Although Shafa is a very important Quranic principle and reflected in the Hadith that Sunni and Shia Muslims have narrated, but some people have not understood shafa ah properly and they think shafa ah is a kind of shirk or shafa ah is you know a kind of superstitious ideas etc and sometimes they quote some quranic verses that deny shafa ah. in the quran we have different groups of verses about shafa ah. Yes, some verses deny Shafa. The reason is because there were some people that through worshipping, for example, angels or worshipping idols, they thought they will be guaranteed Shafa. Surah Zumar verse 3. مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرَّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَ We don't worship them except to make us clearer. Uh, sorry, nearer to God. We want to get nearer to God. Or Yunus 18, in the law. They thought their idols, what they worship other than God, can be shafiq, they can intercede for them. Quran denies such shafa. There are verses that deny shafa. But there are verses that Allah also say, Allah is Shafi'ah. Allah does Shafi'ah. And then there are verses that say, there are people who can do Shafi'ah. Angels, messengers, they can do Shafi'ah. But they need permission. So some verses deny Shafi'ah. Some verses say, Allah is Shafi'ah. Some verses say that there are others who have permission to do shafa'ah some verses say that those who receive shafa'ah should be qualified they must be pleasing to allah so shafa'ah is possible shafa'ah doesn't conflict with tawheed but we have also rejected types of shafa'ah like someone thinks that he can give money to someone to do shafa for him or you know they have for example people that they can force allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to change his opinion no 
Shafi cannot be arrogant. Shafi cannot be someone to, who forces. Shafi is someone who is very close to Allah, very humble, and has had some impact on us in their life, and Allah gives them permission. Uh, he has a beautiful example. He says, uh, some people eat what they have achieved by themselves. For example, they work, they are able to get some money or make some money and buy something. These people are benefiting from their own achievement and efforts. There are people that they are qualified to become guests. They can be invited as guests. A guest receives something from the host. It's not just a result of their own efforts. But to become a guest, you need to be qualified. So Shafa means to receive something extra. No one can say no. Shafa is just receiving what you have done. Nothing extra. No, no, Shafa is extra. For example, someone maybe in Allah has committed sins and the sins are not forgiven. Tawbah has not been there, sincere Tawbah. So the sin is there. And through Shafa, this person may qualify for removal of the burden of the sins. So we cannot reduce Shafa just to see the result of your own efforts. Shafa is something extra, but for the people that are qualified. Surah Anbiya verse 28 says, وَلَا يَشْفَعُونَ إِلَّا لِمَنِ ارْتَضَى Angels do not intercede except for those that are pleasing to Allah. Allah is pleased with them. So Shafa has nothing to do with shirk. Then we have a discussion about rational, intellectual arguments for Tawheed. So I stop here. If you have questions or comments, we can discuss. If not, then I start again with the second part of the class today. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.